I know about it because my youngest daughter has the condition. And I made the diagnosis in her in 2016 when she was really, really ill. And when we kept taking her to the doctors, all they said was it's her eczema. But it seemed to me that she had something much more systemic going on because she was so ill and she had become very ill. She'd been grumbling ill health all her life, which we never quite got to the bottom of. But then she'd made herself mega ill over a four week period because she was so fed up of feeling chronically ill. She had decided to bullet superfoods and she was drinking this green cocktail every day and she was exercising like crazy. And both of those things are really bad if you have histamine intolerance. So she was basically poisoning herself. So she was having avocados, tomatoes, spinach, pineapple, bananas, all the things that are really high in histamine. And she was drinking them and she was making herself sicker and sicker and sicker. Yeah. Until finally, she woke up one morning with angioneurotic edema. Her face was so swollen. It was like a football. She could hardly open her eyes. She had cracks around her mouth so she couldn't even drink. Her skin was so sore to touch because of all the histamine under her skin. She had dermatographism, so you could write her name on her forehead. Um, And she was also fainting, had nausea, everything. All right, Dr. Pierce, there's been a lot of talk about... um, factors that influence, you know, COVID severity and long COVID. And of course, some of them are more rooted in evidence and others are not so rooted in evidence. Um, But one of the key players which popped up for me um, and how I learned about your work is is histamine. So Mm -hmm. I thought we'd first start with you explaining what histamine is and its relevance. Okay, so histamine is um, in all of us and it's got some very important roles. Uh, to play in the human body so it um, it's uh, important for our cognitive function uh, and it affects our sleep rhythm um, uh, circadian rhythms it um, is a neurotransmitter so it's important from that point of view as well it um, it's part of our immune system it's released from the mast cells when we come across a virus or an infection and it has some uh, inf- 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 it causes inflammation and that vasodilatation. It um, it also is important in the stomach, releasing uh, acids in the stomach, which help digest protein. So it's got multiple functions in the body. The important thing is that it's in balance. So the body realizes that it's not good to have too much of a good thing, <laughs> and right. uh, and therefore there are two enzymes that break down histamine to try and keep it in balance in the body and they're HNMT and diamine oxidase and about one to three percent of the population do not have sufficient um, enzyme breaking down uh, histamine breaking down enzymes and and therefore can struggle Um, and of course our modern diets are very high in histamine very, very high in histamine. So if you are one of these one to three percent of the population, you could come unstuck um, if you're having too high a histamine diet. And the histamine therefore builds up in your body. And when it builds up in your body, it causes toxic inflammation. And this inflammation can be in any system. So it's not, it, it would make you an insomniac. Um, It could give you flushing of your face and your neck, your cheeks. It can cause rosacea, eczema, psoriasis. It can cause terrible headaches because it causes vasodilatation. It causes IBS and inflammation of the gut and then leaky gut and all the things that follow on from that. Um, What else? It can cause fibromyalgia with tenderness and pain in the muscles. Um, It can cause aching joints. And um, goodness, the end, the list is sort of as long as your imagination, actually, <laughs> it's incredibly long. <laughs> and so it can cause inflammation in multiple systems. So it can cause asthma, shortness of breath. Um, the vasodilatation can cause low blood pressure. So people get dizziness and fainting or POTS. Um, and uh, yeah, so it goes on and on and on. All these different symptoms that can be caused and they um, can cause a lot of these symptoms in multiple systems and constantly varying and changing you know including urticaria angioneurotic edema dermatographism and so on can cause a lot of confusion in the medical profession because they don't quite know how to put it all together 
Mm, okay. Um, okay, so hmm, that can be problematic. So I have patients who've had these symptoms for decades with no diagnosis and no treatment. Why is it that they're that it's not so well known in, in medicine? Well, it's quite a newly di uh, newly put together and described condition. So whilst all of those symptoms were have been here, you know, from time immemorial, um, they weren't linked until quite recently in the 1990s. And it was it was given a name in the 1990s of histamine intolerance. And then in 2007, uh, the first three publications appeared in the medical journals describing cases. And so it wasn't on anybody's radar until then, really. And if the doctors in the medical profession did not see those three cases, <laughs> then they are blissfully unaware generally about mast cell activation and histamine intolerance. And so even though they're seeing it very frequently, um, they're not diagnosing it, they're not pulling it together, and they're not realizing how to treat it. So um, I would say it, it is incredibly rare. Um, in fact, it's probably never happened that I've got a patient who has got histamine intolerance or mast cell activation and that their GP, or their family practitioner has made that diagnosis and has been helping them with it. Um, and so initially when I learned about the condition and I'm, I don't know about it because I'm super clever or anything. I know about it because my youngest daughter has the condition and I made the diagnosis in her in 2016 when she was really, really ill. And when we kept taking her to the doctors, all they said was it's her eczema. But it seemed to me that she had something much more systemic going on because she was so ill and she had become very ill. She'd been grumbling ill health all her life which we never quite got to the bottom of but then she'd made herself mega ill over a four-week period because she was so fed up of feeling chronically ill she had decided to bullet superfoods and she was drinking this green cocktail every day and she was exercising like crazy and both of those things are really bad if you have histamine intolerance. So oh, she was basically poisoning herself. So she was having avocados, tomatoes, spinach, pineapple, bananas, all the things that are really high in histamine. And she was drinking them and she was making herself sicker and sicker and sicker. Wow. Until finally she woke up one morning with angioneurotic edema. Her face was so swollen. It was like a football. She could hardly open her eyes. She had cracks around her mouth so she couldn't even drink. Her skin was so sore to touch because of all the histamine under her skin. She had dermatographism, so you could write her name on her forehead. Um, and she was also fainting, had nausea. I mean, she had the whole caboose. She had the everything. And she rang me up um, in a panic and crying. Now, she that's not her style. She's very stoic and she's used to feeling unwell. Um, and she doesn't make a fuss. She doesn't make a fuss. So when I heard her crying on the other end of the phone, I knew something seriously was wrong. And I rushed around to pick her up and bring her home. And when I saw her, I couldn't believe how she looked. And then we sat down and we went through everything together. And I looked on the Internet. Now, in 2016, there was a little bit of information about histamine intolerance. When I had looked previously about 10 years before, because I had this thought um, that it might be that, 10 years before I couldn't find anything about it so I sort of drew a blank really but I just stored it away in the back of my mind that maybe there was a histamine issue going on and when we sat down and looked at it together we put we pieced it all together and there's about you know there were about 30 yeah. symptoms that she was experiencing and um, and then I made my diagnosis that she had histamine intolerance and then we tried to find somebody who could help us with that and we took it to six professors and top people in their fields, a top um, dermatologist, a top immunologist, allergy specialist, and they'd never heard of it. And they didn't know how to help us. And they looked at me blankly when I suggested it. So I knew we weren't getting any help there. So that was really, that was a horrible feeling, you know, okay, because it, it made me feel, how, how am I going to help her? She's super ill. And these people don't know what I'm talking about. And I, I, you know, they looked at me like I was slightly mad. <laughs> and, um, and then that's a very, very lonely place to be. And that's where many, many, many people across the world find themselves with this condition. Uh, and then there don't seem to be any answers. I finally found somebody 
through a consultant colleague at, at Queen Mary at uh, Chelsea Westminster Hospital where I was working and um, he said oh I, I have a friend who's a gynecologist um, who knows about I he said to me how's your daughter and I said she's really ill I'm so worried about her I don't know what to do and um, he's, I said, I think it's her mast cells. I think it's her histamine that's the issue. And he said, oh, I have a friend who's a gynecologist at Queen Mary's Char in, uh, and, and at Charlotte's. And he's very interested in mast cells. Let's put you on the phone to him. And I, I could have cried because I told this man all her symptoms and what had been happening. And I said to him, I think she's got histamine intolerance. And he, he said to me, you're absolutely right. Um, and he said, what have you been doing? And I said, well, I've been giving her antihistamines. But he said, right, what dose? And I hadn't been giving her enough because you have to give quite high doses and you give type one and type two antihistamines and you go on a low histamine diet, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where our journey really started. And once I started to learn how to help her, I couldn't help diagnose it in about six or seven people a week who were coming to see me for contraception because I was a consultant in contraception and reproductive health at that time. They were coming for Mirena's and you know, the pill, et cetera, et cetera. And I was taking a history from them and then saying, they'd say, well, I've got IBS and I've got, I, know, I can't tolerate a few foods and, and I get terrible headaches all the time. And, and then I'd say, ah, and I'd ask them some more questions and make the diagnosis. So that's where that came from. But you see, most doctors don't know about it yet. Long COVID, has changed that, I think. So long COVID is putting MCAS and histamine issues on the map, okay? And I think that's uh, the silver lining of all of that, of long COVID. Right, so by 2016, the research on histamine was still limited enough that most doctors didn't know about it? Absolutely. And it's still in its infancy now. So if anybody's interested in research, <laughs> they are very welcome to uh, pick up the baton and start researching more into histamine issues. Um, and uh, we're learning more and more all the time. But we do believe um, that mast cell activation, which affects about 17 percent, we think, of the population, um, is linked in with histamine issues. And, um, and when COVID first came along, I felt that what I was starting to hear from researchers and evidence from people who had acute COVID was that actually they probably had mast cell activation because they had so much hyperinflammation. Do you remember hearing about the hyperinflammation in the lungs, in the tissues, that they had this cytokine storm causing all these problems? Well, the cytokine right. storm is the th over a thousand different chemicals released by your mast cells. And the mast cells have released you know, over a thousand uh, um, cytokines and over 350 chemokines. And the chemokines are little messengers that, that speak to each other and speak to other cells. So uh, they, they create a whole load of other reactions in the body. And, um, and the thousand um, cytokines can be extremely potent chemicals which are designed to be released by the, the mast cells when there's an infection. And then the body's supposed to clear them out quickly. So they're supposed to do their job very effectively, very quickly, and then disappear. Um, but if you've got abnormal mast cells, as 17% of the population do have, then that response is abnormal and it doesn't get switched off. Um, and so then you can get this cascade of more and more cytokines causing more and more inflammation and then that is what causes a lot of the symptoms in the patient. So my hypothesis was that actually we could treat acute COVID by putting patients on a low histamine diet, by giving them antihistamines, type one and type two if you can, but good high doses. Um, and by giving them a mast cell stabilizer, like something like quercetin, which they can buy over the counter, giving them some good vitamins and minerals to support their systems. So vitamin A, vitamin C, Vitamin C is a natural antihistamine, um, uh, selenium, zinc, magnesium, and to um, and every single patient with acute COVID that I've done that for, and it's only been about ten because I only come across them accidentally, you know, coincidentally, <laughs> coincidentally. They they don't I don't run a, an acute COVID clinic. It's only patients who happen to have booked in to see me for something else. And then when I see them on the Zoom, they've got COVID, they've been able to do this. They all start to turn around within 24 hours and some of them super ill, 
super ill like wow. you know with we couldn't some one or two of them couldn't even speak to me because they coughed all the time so every time they took a breath they coughed and when they tried to talk they just coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed and they'd been in bed for 10 days and were getting worse and worse and worse and then I put them on this regimen um, of the vitamin c vitamin d zinc selenium ma magnesium the antihistamines and the the mast cell stabilizer and within 24 hours they're up and about able to shower get out of bed and are getting better so that was my theory and then a, the, a fantastic paper was published in the uh, international journal of infectious diseases in um september on september the 10th by Dr. Lawrence Afrin and Moulderings and Weinstock, and they are experts in mast cell activation syndrome. And they wrote um, a paper which said the hyperinflammation in acute COVID and long COVID could be based in mast cell activation. And I, it's a great paper for anyone who hasn't read it, please read it because it is amazing. And it explains all about mast cell activation, about the infections, how to treat it and everything. And I was so happy to see that they, they, their hypothesis was along the same lines as what I was feeling and thinking. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I have seen several papers now coming out. Um, for example, there was one looking at histamine blockers and uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Femotidine. Yes. Femotidine, yes. It's, uh, reduced yeah. the risk of death by 32%. Yes. From COVID. Yes. So everyone should be having that as soon as they get COVID. So I've I've um organ I'm part of a new organization that your listeners might be really interested in. Um, it's called the Wor World Council for Health, and the website is worldcouncilforhealth.org, and it's a very positive, upbeat website where families and people can get prop good information, reliable, evidence based scientific information about COVID, about health, how to stay healthy, how to boost your immune system. And there are protocols on there of what to do and take and have in your cupboard for, for if you get acute COVID. I love that. Um, and so this is empowering people. It also, we've put protocols on there for treating long COVID. Um, and it was when it was in August last year, I started hearing about the long COVID symptoms. And I just thought, well, that's MCAS. You know, I recognize we're taught to recognize symptoms and signs in medicine. And I was like, well, they're like just like my MCAS patients. Uh, so I went on to BBC um, Look East uh, News and I asked patients with long COVID to download a free app called the People With app. And that's written as one word. And they did. 2000 people did so that I could look at the profiles of their symptoms and lo and behold, their profiles absolutely matched patients with MCAS. So then, OK, I felt obliged to open the clinic because I thought I know how to help these people. I think I know how to help these people. And no one was seemingly doing that apart from a few MCAS doctors and functional medicine people and naturopaths and nutritional therapists who were really you know already in the in the know by and basically helping people so I thought right, I need to do it as well so I opened a clinic on the 1st of November and I put it in my diary till the end of March and within 36 hours it was fully booked I mean it's only it was only only one morning a week because that's all I had time to do unfortunately and I have seen now over 100 long COVID patients, and all except two have a previous history of undiagnosed, untreated mast cell activation syndrome. Real quick, before we keep going, what is mast cell activation syndrome and what is a mast cell? Okay, so mast cells are part of our immune system and they are in the tissues. So they're not so much in our bloodstream, but they're in the tissues. They line the nerves. They line anywhere where the body is in touch with the environment. So under the skin, uh, the, the nasal passages, the oropharynx, the, um, the lungs, the gut, they are lining all of these interfaces with the environment. And they're there as a first line of defense. So in, if you like, they're like bouncers in a, in a nightclub. And they're there to make sure that nothing foreign comes into the body. And if it does, 
they release all these cytokines and the chemokines to tell the, the rest of the body in a big message, we're under attack. This is where it is. This is what we're doing. I need your help. And then other immune cells will come in, migrate into that area to try and sort out that infection. Now, we think that the, uh, there is estimated about 17% of the population are born. So it's family, there's usually a family history of this kind of thing. Um, a genetic predisp uh, pre predisposition to having abnormal mast cells, okay? And there are various kit genes which um, determine your mast cells, and 50 mutations have been identified in the kit genes that can result in mast cell activation syndrome. And what that means is that those mast cells are not, they're not functioning normally. They're a little bit trigger happy. They are just too easy to, to to fire okay so anyone who has eczema their 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 mast cells are triggering and creating that inflammation in their body um, to to various triggers that they should just be ignoring to various stimuli they should just be ignoring and um and they be depending on the combination of the kit mutations people will have it to a greater or lesser extent and some poor patients at one end of the spectrum have chemical sensitivities. You know, they can't take anything. They can't even look at a, a screen of a computer because that will stimulate their mast cells and release these, these histamines, the heparins, the elastase 2, and all these other chemicals. By the way, we don't even know what some of the, the cytokines do. There's a thousand of them and we have no idea what some of them do in the body, but you can bet your bottom dollar they're very potent mm -hmm. and they will be doing something that is not desirable if there's too much of it. Right. Um, and um, so that's what mast cell activation is. And we think that 17% of the population are walking around with, with mast cells that just trigger too much. So they will be people, at, you know, one end of the spectrum, as I say, have got chemical sensitivities, IBS, fibromyalgia, chronic headaches, blah, blah, blah. At the other end of the spectrum, they might just have a bit of IBS, what they describe, a bit of IBS, a bit of, you know, a bit, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes constipation, a bit of bloating. I manage it. I have some food intolerances. I avoid certain foods and I cope with it. So there's a whole host in the middle and various tri different triggers will trigger for different people. So infections is a big trigger infections so whether that's bacterial whether that's fungal mold is a big trigger people who live in moldy houses can will they, their mast cells will be constantly aggravated and stimulated and will make them ill um so there's all sorts of you know it's, it's fascinating we need to learn more I mean, it's in its infancy there's more yeah <laughs> absolutely. absolutely but we can help these people we can help these people so all of my long covid patients get better some get better within a few weeks some gradually get better um with you know in six, when i review them at six weeks they they feel themselves going in a in a different direction that things are calming down some of for some of them because as i said it depends on their mutations um, it might take months, but for some it takes weeks. It's very rewarding work. It's very humbling work. Um, and it's very interesting. A lot of the patients describe themselves as being totally healthy. I was completely healthy before I caught COVID. Caught COVID. Mm. Um, and some of them even had mild COVID. They didn't even have it very badly. Uh, but then crash, a few weeks later, their mast cells have really reacted and they've got inflammation, POTS syndrome, tachycardia, palpitations, terrible headache, insomnia, brain fog, exhaustion, you know, um, total fatigue. People who have chronic fatigue have got MCAS, I believe, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, but I was perfectly healthy before. And then when I say, well, let's just talk, tell me what you were like as a child, you know, in infancy, did you have asthma? Oh, yes, I did. Did you have uh, eczema? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> did you react badly to insect bites? Yes, I do. I react very badly to insect bites um, and so on and so forth. And then you start, you know, oh, and I got IBS that started at university when I started eating pot noodles and and was very stressed it's like okay <laughs> you know and the histamine diet doesn't help that you know our histamine diet is um is is tomatoes and avocados and spinach and all these things that people are eating out of season anyway but they're just eating a lot of them um it's also um a lot of, uh, there are tea and coffee and green tea and alcohol and chocolate are diamine oxidase blockers so they block the diamine oxidase which is the enzyme that breaks down the histamine in your gut 
Um, so if you've got a histamine issue already, the last thing you need is to take things that are going to block and coffee. Now, when I was a little girl, people didn't drink fresh coffee. You know, they maybe had one cup of coffee a day, uh, mostly drank tea, but coffee, fresh coffee, everyone has their own coffee makers at home. They go and see their baristas on the corner. They stand on the station in the morning holding fresh coffee. <laughs> and I just think, oh my God, you, you know, if you've got a histamine issue, you're really going to pay for it. <laughs> It's, it's kind of crazy. I was talking about this. I mean, I always talk about this with new guests. Um, things that you think to be healthy are different based on your situation. Genetics. Yes, your genetics. And what I would love is for everyone to know their genetics. So it was something I started doing in my, my long COVID patients and my muscle activation patients and something that made a huge difference for my daughter. And I would encourage everyone to do this if they have got these issues um, is we worked out we did her genetic testing and we worked out her methylation cycle her histamine cycle um, her estrogen cycle and then thyroid is another really good one and we did a nutrition report a company i use is called life code gx and they're superb absolutely superb their reports are so in so full of detail and so are easy to follow and really really helpful and it's nutrigenomics so it's not finding out about genes you cannot influence with your nutrition it's genes that you can influence to behave better and to perform more efficiently because it would be very frustrating to know about genes that you've got that you can't do anything about that would be a bit sort of miserable really and depressing but the nutrigenomics is they look at only the genes that can be influenced and um, and by knowing them for my daughter and for my patients, we were able to support their system and tailor make the vitamins and minerals and things that they needed to help their poorly performing genes perform better, their detoxification genes, etc., which help their whole system. Now, very interestingly, I have seen patients who have had abnormal liver function tests elevated ALT and AST and six weeks after sorting out their genetics and supporting their systems their liver function tests have gone back completely to normal healthy normal within six weeks so it can be very dramatic and they feel better they look better and they feel better uh, and then hopefully they're able to come off some of the tablets and some of the medication and only use it when they have a bit of a crisis you know when they know that it's going up whatever now, to briefly summarize um, some take home points here for people that are listening that think they do have a an issue with histamine or mast cell activation syndrome, what are some things that they can start looking into doing? OK, so I think they need to look at the histamine in their diet. And if they suspect they've got an issue, having a low histamine diet for, say, um, you know, three months um and taking some antihistamines regularly should make an uh, an improvement it should improve their symptoms and so that is it's very much a clinical diagnosis that we make there are very few labs or no labs really in the uk that will help you diagnose histamine intolerance because it requires special equipment and so on and i think in the in america it's different they have got labs that will be able to do the right tests um, so we're a bit stuck. So we have to make a clinical diagnosis. And certainly if you, the history is really important. So people can look at my website. They can look at drtinapiers.com or another website I have, which is menopauseconsultancy.co.uk. I've got a lot of information on there about histamine. Um, on the menopause one, it's specifically about women and histamine and at the menopause it can become an issue. Um, and, uh, and there's information on there about long covid which applies to MCAS. So everything that I've said about long COVID was a PDF we put together, some very interesting lectures that are, there are links to. Uh, there's two lectures called the Pentad lectures. I would encourage everyone to watch them on YouTube. Dr. Andrew Hill, who's a pediatric cardiologist in California, and he links the mast cell with so many symptoms that people will really relate to, EDS, POTS, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so I would encourage people to learn and read and, and see as much as they can about the condition. Follow a low histamine diet, take some over-the-counter antihistamines, but at good doses. So loratadine or cetirizine, 10 milligrams, three or four times a day is safe. So that's eight hourly or six hourly. And uh, or fexofenadine, um, 120 milligrams we can buy over the counter here. 
Um, and that's that would be again three or four times a day if you're having a bad day take it four times if you can get hold of some type 2 antihistamines like famotidine that can be a real game changer um, and also uh, an, a, a mast cell stabilizer like quercetin which you can buy over the counter take it three times a day um, and to also take the vitamins and minerals so vitamin d make sure your vitamin d is good and take a slow release vitamin c 3000 milligrams a day some zinc and selenium and um, mang manganese, uh, some magnesium, uh, a good multivitamin mineral tablet usually, and drink plenty of water e and exercise. They might want to do weight bear weight weights kind of exercise rather than cardiac because cardiac exercise increases histamine release yeah. and can make them feel worse, which is what happens in the long COVID patients. Got so it. They, they what would be the worse. dosing in uh, for quercetin? Quercetin is 500 milligrams three times a day. 500 milligrams three times a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah. And, and then to look for a functional medicine practitioner or a, an MCAS doctor who can help them. Um, it's, you have to, it's a lot of it, it's trial and error. So one person might really suit loratadine and find that more potent. Another person, it might be cetirizine. Another person, it might be. Um, it might be fexfenadine or uh, it might be um, uh, Benadryl or something like that. But they and also you can have prescribed mast cell stabilizers like Rupatadine and Ketotifen, and they can be really, really helpful. Yeah, I know we're coming up on the on the edge of, of our time here, but um, the FLCCC, the Frontline COVID-19 yes. Critical Care yes. Alliance, they've also put together some protocols. For, yes, um, I, I, for I've worked with them. I mean, my name is on their protocol. <laughs> oh, I did not so know that. I, I, know, I know them very well. Um, and they're wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful people. Yes. So, um, yeah, so our protocol, uh, my protocol is in there. We, we worked as a group of experts together and put that protocol together. And, um, and there's another excellent website your readers might like, listeners might like to hear, uh, look at rather. And that is um, bird-group.org, as in flyingbird-group.org and that's a new organization we put together in January uh, which is all about um, ivermectin and the evidence that is there is for ivermectin to be used and I know that's used in many many parts of the world very successfully. Right like um, in India I think it's been Oh Uda Pradesh amazing Uda yeah. Pradesh incredible they turned it around in 10 days Wow. Um, they reduced their cases something like 97 <laughs> percent they now have no COVID you know they do not have a COVID problem in Uttar Pradesh 100 241 million people in that region wow. and uh, yeah absolutely incredible and they did that with ivermectin for to be used both prophylactically and also for acute COVID yeah and there are lots of doctors around the world treating acute COVID very effectively which is what the FLCCC recommend well, I, I probably have like another hour worth of <laughs> worth of questions for you. Um, but sadly, I have an interview soon and you also have to get going very soon. Yeah. So um, before we go, where can people find out more about your work? You mentioned a few websites. Yes. So I think that in the uh, COVID pandemic, people should um, look at the worldcouncilforhealth.org website. I think that's going to be a really good go-to website. They can sign up for our newsletter so they don't miss any new information that's coming out because we're constantly adding to the, um, the website. It's evidence-based. It's very open. We have our council meetings on a Monday, um, UK time, 8 till 10, and we are live streaming those now. So if anyone wants to watch what's going on, and it's doctor, mostly doctors, Oh, we also have a legal team, but we also have other scientists and um, other people in our in our team. And we discuss various issues and people report from different parts of the world what's happening with COVID in their part of the world. It's fascinating. Anyone interested, please do join us and live uh, to the live streaming or watch it afterwards. The, but there's really it's a really good source. We want it to be a go to place for people to get reliable, trustworthy, honest information about how to stay healthy. Um, and not be afraid. If you don't mind, I do have one final question, and it's a huge controversial question, but what are your thoughts um, on the vaccines? Okay. <laughs> we need about half an hour to talk yeah, about Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, um, I, my children had all their vaccines. Um, I have had AstraZeneca. 
My husband's had AstraZeneca. My son has had Pfizer. Um, if I knew then what I know now, I would not have had it. Okay. I would have wanted my own body to manage COVID if I had to take, you know, caught COVID. So we know that 98 to 99% of people make a full recovery from COVID. In the UK, the average age of death for women is 84 from COVID and 81 for men, uh, for men from COVID, okay? It's the elderly population. And most of them had many multi multiple comorbidities. So three to five comorbidities. So they were not very well people. Some elderly people survive it very well. And there's been some very interesting cases. So there were two Spanish, uh, um, two Spanish old people's homes with 84 elderly, very elderly uh, residents. They put them all on antihistamines and none of them died from COVID. They all got it. They all tested positive and none of them died from COVID, which fits in with my MCAS theory. Okay. So um, there, this condition, this disease, I think can be treated acutely. And the best kind of immunity is to have natural immunity. If you have natural immunity, you will be immune against all of the variants. You may still get it, but you'll get it mildly. And then your body will recognize parts of the virus, not just the spike protein, but the other parts of the virus. Right. And you will, you will have a good, um, you know, a good immune response to it. And, um, and I think that's really, really important. And we need to trust on nature, really. There have been a lot of adverse effects from the, from the vaccine. And there have been a lot of deaths from the vaccine. And I don't think the general public are aware of that. And they need to look at the VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, official website. They can look at the um, MHRA yellow card in the UK. And there is a Eurovigilance website for Europe. And there have been tens of thousands of deaths. Um, and what is striking me now is that many, many, many people have been vaccinated in the UK. But I'm hearing about more and more cases of COVID. And they're in the vaccinated people. They're in unvaccinated too, but generally people. So it's not stopping people catching the Delta variant, which is what, you know, it was supposed to stop us catching it. And it's, it, so it's not doing its, it's what it was supposed to do. Um, and I'm also hearing about some tragic cases of, of vaccine injuries, including a 19 year old girl who we knew who died five days after the vaccine. She started to get a severe headache as soon as she had the vaccine. And then she died five days later from this massive cerebral ventricular clot in her brain. Uh, we know of another, another friend who's 64 year old, fit and well, very, very healthy guy, um, had swelling of his ankles as soon as he had the vaccine and uh, clots in his ankles dislodged, gave him two massive heart attacks and he died. Um, we know of a young girl locally, 28 year old, very fit, healthy, used to run and exercise and do everything normal. And she now has 15 epileptic fits a day after having her second dose of the vaccine. Um, I, I could just go on and on. There are so many and more and more of my patients are now hearing about vaccine injuries. They know somebody who know, you know, who has had a death or a, a vaccine, severe vaccine injury. I've got two GP friends who've got brothers in their 50s who both have had massive strokes and they were very fit guys who were cycling and running and they both got massive had massive strokes and blood clots post-vaccine so I think we need to be very careful I think we should pause the vaccine program I think we should take stock I think we need to have scientific debate and evidence we need to look at what what's happened so far I definitely think it should not be given to children because we have no medium and long-term safety data and uh, there's a very good website called Safer to Wait for parents to look at, Safer to Wait. And there's an excellent website called UKFreedomProject.org. And that's been put together by two amazing women who have taken the trouble to find all the official figures from the UK government sites, and they have put them onto the UK Freedom Project website for people to see because Whilst they're there for the public to see, people don't quite know how to access these things, but they put them in plain sight for people to see for themselves so they can make an informed decision about treatments, etc. So it's about honesty and truth and seeing the data, isn't it?
No, I, I really appreciate um, you being honest because I've had guests on the podcast who are both sides, different, different, totally yeah. different opinions. Um, but I always appreciate um, honesty in what you see, but also like a kind of humility. Like we need more information. We need more information. Um, we do. We, do. we also, definitely need. Yeah. And I, I would press pause while we gather that because right. the danger, the evidence is there of severe adverse health effects um, including death and I think whilst whilst that's now that that's been flagged up we can't ignore it so we should yeah. press pause and we should sit and discuss it with people on both sides of the argument and look at the data in the cool you know cold light of day and decide what we want to do as a society and what is safe and what isn't safe what's acceptable what isn't acceptable um, and, you know, children are, do not very, very seldom die from COVID. So they have more chance of being struck by lightning than they do of dying from COVID. But we are seeing COVID deaths in children who are being vaccinated. To me, that's not an acceptable risk. Yeah, and we don't know what the future holds for them because we don't have the medium and long-term safety data. Of course. So yeah. that's too risky. Our children are our pride and joy. They are our future. They are everything. We should right. be we should be keeping them as safe as possible <laughs> yeah i don't know if you know um peter doshi he's one of the editors of the british medical journal um i've been in contact with him and that's you know that's a huge concern that he's brought up over and yeah. over yeah 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 i have heard him i've heard his i've seen a letter i think that he he wrote in fact i think i heard him on a uh, on a uh, twitter or something yeah 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 yes but you know there is a lot of censorship if i said what i've just said now on Twitter, it would be taken down within seconds. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Final yeah. point. I also want people who are hearing this and are very polarized. Like you said, I, I hate when people throw around labels when they're not true and they don't give the full picture, like anti-vaxxer, just because yeah. you you have some issues with this one vaccine yeah. does not mean that you are anti-vax. And I want people to really appreciate that and and open up your mind and, and let go of some of those biases that we have i absolutely agree and i think we need to be very I'm, i don't like the rhetoric that's coming out about vaccinated and unvaccinated people at the moment i think that's completely uh, unhelpful i think it's completely wrong and unjust and actually we may find that it's the unvaccinated people who are going to help us come out of this so we think they're going to be our saviors because there are some very top scientists and immunologists who feel that the vaccine is pushing the variants to form and then the unvaccinated people when they catch the variant it stops there and it doesn't go into another variant uh, and therefore we may be um, and, and we know that the vaccinated are catching the virus just as much as the unvaccinated so you can catch it so actually a passport isn't worth the paper it's written on you know it's just sort of it's the same whether you're vaccinated or not you can be contagious and you can catch it um, so it's a it's a you know to have to withhold uh, privileges from people because they have decided for whatever reason that they don't want to be vaccinated is um, draconian and against our civil liberties and I really worry about that yeah yeah me too um Dr. Pierce, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was a very enlightening conversation. Um, I know it's going to help a lot of people. I hope so. I do hope so. Um, there, there is a, there is a. Uh, I did put on an um, a conference in June on treating long COVID. I called it the TLC conference, and I've got a website called treatlongcovid.com. And all of the lectures are on the website. People can still look at them. So please, please. And there's an excellent lecture on there by, by Dr. Lawrence Afrin talking about MCAS. So if anyone thinks they might have MCAS, please go to that website and have a look at his, uh, his lecture, which is excellent. Just to, as a, a, you know, to start your learning, really, and understanding the conditions. Perfect. I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, Dr. Pierce, thank you thank again you. very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job. You really are.